welcome to the SICK Network Podcast, a weekly podcast discussing current and topical issues affecting SICKs across the global diaspora. Sacrificing SICKs, the need for an investigation, the highly anticipated report commissioned by the SICK Federation UK. Written by Phil Miller, narrated by Sonny Osan, commission designed and published by the Sikh Federation UK. Executive Summary In January 2014, top-secret UK government files were accidentally released to the National Archives. They revealed that a British Special Forces officer visited Amritsar in 1984 to advise the Indian Army ahead of an attack on the Sikh faith's holiest site, in which thousands of pilgrims were massacred. Then Prime Minister David Cameron refused calls for a public inquiry, instead hastily commissioning an in-house review which claimed that the British advice was an isolated incident that had limited impact on the subsequent attack. The Sikh Federation UK first raised serious concerns on limitations of the in-house review by leading civil servant Sir Jeremy Haywood before it was published and presented to Parliament in February 2014. There were inherent limitations with the in-house review, as it was rushed and deliberately too narrowly focused. Whilst the UK government claims there is no need to investigate Britain's role in India's repression of Sikhs, This report sets out extensive evidence that raises serious concerns about the veracity of the UK's official narrative. This report is not an attempt to rewrite history, an accusation which has been directed by the British government at truth campaigns in Northern Ireland doing similar archival research. Rather, it is the Conservative government itself, through its ongoing censorship, who seem to be distorting and manipulating history to suit its own ends. This report is a modest attempt at truth recovery and better understanding the legacy of a bitter conflict. It is the first look at the government's private account from this period of UK-Indian relations, insofar as the public are allowed access to the records. The conclusions it reaches inevitably diverge from the official narrative, precisely because it takes into account facts that the government wanted to remain hidden at the time and still do to this day. Extensive research by the Sikh Federation UK has found that British involvement in India's repression of Sikhs in 1984 went much further than the UK government has ever officially acknowledged, in that, bullet point one, Cameron killed off his own transparency revolution. More than half of Foreign Office files on India from 1984 have been censored in whole or in part with civil servants centrally involved in the events of 1984 now blocking disclosures under the 30-year rule. Information about the special forces and intelligence agencies is exempt from disclosure under the Freedom of Information and Public Records Acts, meaning that only an independent inquiry is capable of recovering the truth. Bullet point two. Cabinet Office has withheld vital records examined in the Haywood Review. A Freedom of Information request for these records was first submitted on 30 December 2014. There have been unacceptable delays by the Cabinet Office at each stage of the process. It is the subject of an appeal to the Information Tribunal with a three-day hearing scheduled for March 2018. More than 30 years after the event, there remains a reluctance to release relevant information that will expose the UK and Indian governments. Bullet Point 3 Despite warnings a year earlier of disastrous consequences and a bloodbath, Margaret Thatcher sent an SAS officer to advise on attacking the sixth holiest site. In April 1983, the British High Commissioner, Sir Robert Wade Gerry, warned the UK government of the disastrous consequences of any attempt by the government to use force to enter the Golden Temple precincts. Yet within a year of a warning of a bloodbath, Margaret Thatcher had sent a special forces officer to advise the Indian Army on how to attack the holy site and demonstrated Britain's complete support for a military solution. Bullet Point 4 
paramilitary assistance provided immediately after SAS visit. India requested British training and equipment for its police paramilitary units immediately after the SAS officer had advised on coordinating paramilitary units for an attack on Amritsar. The Foreign Office wanted to supply India with internal security equipment that it knew could be used to raid Amritsar. For example, on the morning after the SAS advisor left India, the MOD sent a telegram to a company called Bellstaff International Limited asking if it could supply bulletproof vests to the Indian Border Security Force. Bullet point 5. Peace talks collapsed the day SAS left India. Immediately after the SAS officer carried out his reconnaissance of Amritsar with an Indian Special Forces unit, six pulled out of peace talks claiming they had seen a commando unit move into the city. The negotiations never recovered and ultimately led to an all-out assault in June 1984. Bullet point 6. SAS advice on attacking the holy site increased terror threat to UK. Although the SAS provided advice for an attack on Amritsar, Whitehall analysts said that such an assault would increase the risk of terrorism in the UK. In 1985-86, MI5's Director General put Sikh extremism at the top of the list of any terrorist threat to mainland Britain, despite the fact Six had never been a terrorist threat to the UK, any officials or the wider public. MI5 admitted in October 1986 that since June 1984 there had only been relatively minor incidences. Bullet point 7. Were practices from British counter-insurgency campaigns shared with Indian security forces that led to excesses, including torture? Britain's defence attaché in India from 1983 to 1986 was a veteran of colonial counter-insurgency campaigns in Kenya and Malaya, and held a senior position in the Ulster Defence Regiment HQ at the peak of British army collusion with loyalist paramilitaries in the 1970s. This raises concerns that abusive practices from British counter-insurgency campaigns were shared with Indian security forces. Bullet point 8. Indian Army Chief received confidential briefing in 1984 on counter-insurgency equipment. The FCO files released on 20 July 2017 show in correspondence from March 1985 that the British Army advised the Chief of Army Staff of the Indian Army, General Vaidya, who planned Operation Blue Star in June 1984. The March 1985 letter shows he received a confidential briefing from the British Army earlier in 1984 about counter-insurgency and internal security equipment to help deal with domestic unrest from six in Punjab. This was mistakenly, or more likely deliberately, missed by Haywood in his review. Bullet point 9. Advice from British experts in counter-insurgency. There were very specific British media reports in June 1984 naming Indian intelligence officers Giresh Chandra Gary Saxena and Rameshwar Nath Kao as making trips to the UK to seek expertise. The information that has been carefully pieced together in this report about counter-insurgency support and the timing of the SAS visit brings these media reports into sharp focus. A week after the attack, it was reported in the Sunday Times that assault troops were alerted to invade the temple no fewer than five times during the past three months, i.e. the period immediately after the SAS reconnaissance. Bullet point 10. Whitehall expected raid on Amritsar day before Blue Star. The UK government anticipated a raid on Amritsar the day before Operation Blue Star, but did nothing to try and stop it. The UK government did not urge Indira Gandhi to seek a peaceful solution to tensions in the Punjab and believed that a show of force would boost the Indian leader's chances of re-election. Nor did the UK government provide any warnings or travel advice to the hundreds of thousands of Sikhs living in the UK. Most Sikhs, when they visit Punjab, go to Amritsar, suggesting the UK government was grossly negligent knowing what we know now. Bullet point 11. Further SAS assistance considered within weeks of Amritsar massacre. Whitehall considered 
and probably provided further SAS assistance to Indian forces weeks after the Amritsar massacre. One letter, in which British officials discussed possible SAS training for India's new National Security Guard, was inadvertently released to the UK National Archives in August 2016. This should have been acknowledged by Sir Jeremy Haywood in his 2014 review, but was omitted, calling into question the adequacy of that review. The National Security Guard went on to carry out two more raids of the Sri Harmandar Saib or Golden Temple complex in Amritsar in 1986 and 1988, as well as a number of notorious operations in Punjab villages. Bullet Point 12 How far did cooperation extend between MI5 and Indian intelligence? Significant cooperation between UK and Indian intelligence agencies developed after June 1984. According to MI5's official historian, the security service wanted to improve its agent-running efforts inside Sikh diaspora groups in 1986. Given that many Sikhs detained in Indian security services were tortured, such cooperation and infiltration raises serious concerns that MI5 received information obtained through torture or shared intelligence with Indian counterparts who used torture. Bullet Point 13 Sale of military equipment to India in the 1980s was of paramount importance with the UK government turning a blind eye to human rights. India was one of Britain's top three purchasers of military equipment from 1981 to 1990, at times buying more British weapons than Saudi Arabia. As with the Al Yamama deal, Thatcher personally intervened at the highest level to stop France winning key contracts with India. The UK government was well aware of India's appalling human rights record and repressive actions by the state police and paramilitary groups. However, this was overlooked and ignored in the interests of progressing lucrative arms deals. Bullet Point 14 Repressive measures against Sikhs were carried out in the UK to appease Indian government and secure arms deals. The Indian government made astonishing requests of Britain. For example, the Indian government asked Britain unsuccessfully, to intern leaders of Sikh Gudwaras in the UK. In a meeting on 8 June 1984, a leading Indian foreign affairs official complained to the British High Commission about the inadequate security Britain was providing to his diplomatic staff in London and implied British police should shoot dead Sikh protesters. However, other repressive measures were carried out to appease Indian government concerns such as extensive special branch surveillance of peaceful Sikh protests, banning religious marches and demonstrations, measures to disrupt Sikh sport tournaments, an extradition treaty, and deporting a Sikh activist who went on to be tortured in India. Bullet Point 15 British trade with India from 1984 was dependent on the UK taking anti-Sikh measures to win favour with India. The scope of any proper inquiry must extend until at least Rajiv Gandhi's death in 1989, given the initial trade embargo when he came to power and Britain then winning major trade deals during his premiership. Haywood's claim that the decision to send an SAS advisor to Amritsar was not motivated by trade concerns seems fanciful. Bullet Point 16. Misuse of the aid budget to subsidise defence sales to India. Trade concerns dominate the British files on India from this period. This report reveals extensive records about efforts to persuade India to sign a contract with Westland's helicopters in exchange for millions of pounds in aid money. Although there was internal debate and division between Whitehall departments about the merits of using aid money to secure this contract, the British High Commissioner in New Delhi and Thatcher were consistently in favour of Westland's winning the contract. The Haywood Review hardly made any reference to the extent of these efforts to secure the Westlands helicopter deal, as well as the other military contracts that were in the pipeline. India was Britain's highest recipient of aid in 1984, receiving 24% of the aid budget. This was not done out of charity. The files are clear that aid was expected to pay dividends. Bullet Point 17 Appeasing the Indian government by applying pressure on the British media to suppress Sikh views. This report highlights several incidences of appeasing India. In October 1983, the Foreign Office at a meeting with Thames Television 
dissuaded one of the program's producers from including India in a documentary on abusive regimes. Following coverage of Indira Gandhi's assassination, the BBC chairman responded to pressure from Thatcher, giving the BBC's Assistant Director General strict instructions on special clearance needed from him on who could broadcast on the BBC. A week after the assassination, on 8 November, the BBC Director General wrote a letter to the Indian High Commissioner apologising for broadcasting an interview signalling that the free expression of six in the UK had been curtailed. Bullet point 18. Serious conflicts of interest have increased censorship. In this report, we have pointed out several serious conflicts of interest involving key personnel with a vested interest in censoring the truth. Bruce Cleghorn, CMG, was one of the sensitivity reviewers in 2015 tasked with the censoring of documents, but he was a diplomat at the British High Commission in Delhi in 1983 and the South Asia Department in London 1984. A week before the Amritsar massacre, Cleghorn wrote, It would be dangerous for the UK government to be identified with any attempt to storm the Golden Temple in Amritsar. He was also named as the correspondent about possible SAS assistance to India immediately after the Amritsar massacre. Sir John Ramsden is a member of the Advisory Council on National Records and Archives, a panel that adjudicates on government censorship applications. Sir John was a key member at the FCO South Asia Department in 1984. He not only wrote the letter considering further SAS assistance for India immediately after the Amritsar massacre, but he also argued in favour of equipping Indian paramilitary forces including rubber bullets. Although some Sikhs probably changed their view on Britain in January 2014, when Britain's role emerged, the community's response has been entirely peaceful. Despite numerous hurdles, the response from the Sikh community, led by the Sikh Federation UK, has been level-headed and sought to establish the truth of the full extent of the UK role in the 1980s in assisting India at home and abroad. The campaign over the last three and a half years has had both a legal and political focus with the objective to create sufficient public pressure on the UK government. Despite much information being withheld, this report proves the in-house review was at best inadequate and at worst a cover-up. The period intentionally selected for the Hayward Review of December 1983 to June 1984 allowed it to overlook a considerable amount of context which clearly demonstrate the paramount importance of arms sales to Anglo-Indian relations in the build-up to Operation Blue Star. In February 2014, Haywood downplayed the situation and concluded that the military advice was a one-off, a position repeated by number 10. This has now been shown to be untrue, as the in-house review was not as rigorous or thorough as claimed, and Parliament and the wider public have been misled. The in-house review also stated that no other form of UK military assistance, such as equipping or training, was given to the Indian authorities in relation to Operation Blue Star. This was repeated several times by the Foreign Secretary in Parliament. This has also been proved not to be true. This report raises serious doubts about the adequacy and integrity of the Hayward Report, and shows Parliament was disturbingly misled in February 2014 as to the motivations and full extent of UK involvement. It is now all the more important for the current Prime Minister and Home Secretary to announce an independent public inquiry to get the truth, however painful and damaging, of what happened in the 1980s. The inquiry will send a positive signal to the law-abiding British Sikh community, the wider public, and parliamentarians so we can all learn from it and ensure it never happens again. Welcome to the Sikh Network Podcast, a weekly podcast discussing current and topical issues affecting Sikhs across the global diaspora.